Hey everybody, this is Ryan McClanahan with History2Cards.com. Hope you're all doing very well today. I found out that Frank Manzetta had a set issued in 1991 of his artwork. And uh, the 1991 set is a, a Series 1, and the Series 2 came out in 1993. I always loved Frank Manzetta's artwork, and uh, when I was a kid, my dad brought home a print of his Death Dealer. This is a awesome uh, a piece of artwork. I really love Frank Manzetta's work ever since. And I wanted to share some of that with you today. I didn't know that he actually had sets that were issued during his lifetime. Actually, back in high school, I became a professional artist. Uh, and I recently stopped in 2017 because I have uh, a, a lot of pain in my hands uh, due to arthritis. And I was hoping kind of to get... Uh, to doing more artwork, and, but I'm not sure if that's going to work out these days. I really kind of love uh, his work and a lot of uh, artwork in general. And I, I did actually go to school to be a uh, commercial artist and uh, in sign design. Uh, and so uh, I have kind of done everything that I really wanted to do in life. I wanted to be a writer and I became a writer, a journalist. And I wanted to become an artist, and I did basically everything that I wanted to do in life. And I also wanted to complete uh, a nice sports card collection that I could be proud of, as you guys can see in the back here. Um, that's going to be a continuing thing throughout my life, being a collector of, of some sort or whatever. Um, I'm kind of slowing down in, on uh, the card collecting, at least... <laughs> that's my plan. I kind of find the research more fun than collecting cards, which is kind of strange, but uh, I really do. I, I kind of have every card that I really want, which I say that, and then I go to a show, and then I find a card that I'm like, oh my god, that is so cool. I've got to grab that. Thank you so much. Um, that, that always happens, so you never know what you're going to uh, find at a show. Like I said, Frank finds out his work is absolutely amazing, at least I think so. So artwork and literature and movies, they're very subjective. So uh, what I may like, you guys may not. What uh, I think is trash, you guys may be like, oh, that's so cool, you know? Uh, so it's it's subjective to everybody, right? Um, and that's true with like everything. Like I said, movies, artwork, literature... Uh, they mean something to different people, but uh, today I wanted to share with you Frank Benzetta's work, and I found uh, a couple of really neat art articles as well that I want to share with you as well to kind of like encompass his entire career. So here we go. This is from the National Post, May 20th, 2010, Toronto, Ontario, Canada. The Artist and the Barbarian by Scott Van Weinsberg. On May 10th, artist Frank Manzetta died at the age of 82. His career embraced comics, paperbacks, movies, soft porn, vampires, heavy metal music, and even a famous Californian politician. His talent did not land Franzetta in the finest art galleries, but it did win him generations of fans. Born in Brooklyn in 1928 as Frank Frazetta, he eventually dropped the second Z, deeming it to be a visual annoyance. The artist-to-be drew attention while still a child. Impressed by his doodling, his school teachers urged his parents to send him to a local institute, the Brooklyn Academy of Fine Arts. He was only eight years old. At the academy, Frazetta spent years studying under one Michael Falanga, a shadowy figure who left behind few traces. Falanga was the first of a series of mentors who dominated much of Franzetta's life. Had this instructor not died in 1944, Franzetta later remarked to Newsweek magazine, I might be another Andrew Wyeth. Left without direction, the 16-year-old Franzetta did what many teenagers would do if they could draw. He turned to comic books. 
After becoming the assistant of comic artist John Gunita, he convinced his boss to help him publish a story, and the result was Snowman, a piece that ran in the first issue of Tally Ho Comics, dated December 1944. Ironically, given what was to come, Snowman marked a period in which Franzetta aimed much of his efforts at very young kids. During 1947 through 1949, for example, he energetically handled such Disney-ish comic book characters as Hockey Duck and Bruno Bear. In 1948, however, Franzetta took a fateful step when he drew an installment of Judy of the Jungle for Exciting Comics number 59. Thereafter, he would often be associated with jungle adventures, notably through a one-shot Tarzan knockoff, Thunder No. 1, dated April 1952, now ranked among his finest works. With Thunder to his credit, Franzetta inevitably turned up at the collaborated publishing house of E.C., whose comics featured some of the best talent in the business. Alas, his E.C. work during the first half of the 1950s was infrequent and tended to be in collaboration with other artists, a key partner being Roy Knekel, who would provide shrewd advice in later years. In fact, Franzetta was more interested in shifting to newspaper comic strips, and he even launched his own strip, Johnny Comet, in 1952. Nicely drawn, but otherwise bland. The story of a race car driver flopped in syndication. Undeterred, Franzetta started ghosting a Flash Gordon strip for artist Dan Berry in 1953. This was followed by a job offer from Al Cap, creator of famous Little Abner strip. For close to a decade, Franzetta would handle the weekend installments of Little Abner, while Cap would take the credit. Although Cap paid well, the long years spent anonymously drawing those goofy hillbilly characters were later regretted by Franzetta. At last, in the early 1960s, he gave in to naggings of friend Roy Kronekel to quit. Desperate for new work and unable to find traction in a changing comic book world, he wound up in the emerging field of sex magazines. The many months he spent with such mustache-twirling periodicals as Gent, Dude, Cavalcade, and even Playboy itself were not quite slumming. Because they helped him refine what came to be called the Franzetta female, in the introduction to a 1975 collection of Franzetta art, Belly Ballantyne described this unusual creature as small of stature but lusciously round and curved, often nude or nearly so, the Franzetta female also featured a doll-like face, which could be very odd in combination with the ample posterior. When accused of smut and sexism, Franzetta shrugged. I gave the fans what they want, he told Newsweek in 1977. Pure fantasy, a bit broady, a bit raunchy. Franzetta's future was not, however, in pornography. In 1964, the trusty Roy Kronekel tipped him off about an increasingly lucrative market in cover art for science fiction and fantasy pocketbooks. Directed by Kronekel, the publishing houses of Ace and Lancer, Frazetta got his big break. Ace was then reprinting the novels of Edgar Rice Burroughs, and Frazetta, with his love of jungles, found himself assigned most of the Tarzan books. Sometimes struggling in his new format, Franzetta reportedly needed help from Kronekel with technique and composition. Persevering, he produced some small masterpieces, including Jungle Tales of Tarzan and Tarzan and the Lost Empire. With Tarzan and the Jewels of Opar, one can almost feel the violence as the hero lunges toward a lion set to pounce on a Franzetta female. Tarzan was just the beginning, and Franzetta was soon getting work at venues as disparate as Mad Magazine and Hollywood Studios. He did the poster for the 1965 Peter Sellers Woody Allen comedy, What's New Pussycat? The real turning point, however, was in 1966, 
when Lancer published Conan the Adventurer, which reprinted bloodstained tales of a barbarian fantasy figure created by the pulp magazine writer Robert E. Howard. An automatic classic, Franzetta's cover for Conan the Adventurer sh showed a brutal, glaring Conan standing on a pile of slain enemies with a Franzetta female clinging to his leg. Franzetta would paint seven more Conan covers for Lancer over the next five years, sparking a craze. In turn, the books inspired comics, and the comics helped bring about a 1982 movie, Conan the Barbarian, which made a star out of Arnold Schwarzenegger. The movie itself is actually mediocre, but the director, John Millis, has lately confirmed to the Los Angeles Times that Franzetta's visual influence was a primary consideration during the filming. So, to a significant degree, then Schwarzenegger owes his subsequent career to Franzetta. The primitive ferocity of Franzetta's covers became a profound influence on the headbanging crowd. Over the years, such heavy metal groups as Molly Hatchet, Nazareth, and Wolf Mother have all used Franzetta's imagery. One former heavy metal musician, Glenn Danzig, went on to found a publishing firm, Verotic, which collaborated with Franzetta in the 1990s. Another heavy metal figure, Metallica's Kirk Hammett, is said to have spent a million dollars in 2009 to obtain the original painting for the book Conan the Conqueror. Vampire fans also had reason to adore Franzetta, thanks to his involvement with the company called Warren. Starting in 1965, needless to say, Roy Kronekel had a role in this move, too. Warren published large-format black-and-white comic books, chief of which were creepy and eerie, and Franzetta painted at least two vampire-related covers for them. In 1969, Warren brought out Vampirella, a comic with a specific vampire theme, and, of course, Franzetta did the cover for the first issue. The main character, Vampirella, was a gorgeous alien bloodsucker dressed in go-go boots and not much else. She was so popular that she outlived Warren, and her comic book escapades have since continued at other companies. By the second half of the 1970s, Franzetta was one of the world's top commercial artists. In 1975, Bantam Books brought out a glossy volume, The Fantastic Art of Frank Manzetta, which sold 175,000 copies within two years. In 1976, the World Fantasy Awards honored him as Best Artist, which complemented a science fiction prize, the Hugo, that he earned a decade earlier. In 1977, when Clint Eastwood brought out the action movie The Gauntlet, it was Franzetta who did the poster. In 1978, when the original version of the television series Battlestar Galactica emerged, Franzetta handled the first covers of a spin-off series of novels. There was even a joint effort with independent animator Ralph Bakshi, although the result feature-length cartoon Fire and Ice, 1982, was disappointing. Before his death, Fred, one of Francetta's last major projects centered on the Death Dealer, an image of a satanic axe-wielding warrior on horseback, which he first painted in the 1970s. Genuinely disturbing, this picture haunted Franzetta himself for years, and he decided to recycle it into a sequence of novels written for him by James Silk during 1988 through 1990. The books are minor, but they represent a nihilistic final stage of the process he had taken Franzetta from funny animals to Conan and beyond barbarism, as it turns out, is a tough job. This is from the Morning Call, uh, Allentown, Pennsylvania, March 27th, 2010. Artist says he never told son he could have his paintings. Frank Manzetta Jr. charged in break-in and thefts, claims he had permission to take artwork. World-renowned artist Frank Manzetta Sr. 
spoke publicly for the first time since his family feud went public in December 2009, and he's mad, mad at the son who's charged with trying to steal $20 million worth of his paintings, his life's work. Frank Sr. said he never gave Frank Franzetta Jr. permission to take his paintings. In an exclusive interview with the Pernoco record, Frank Franzetta Sr. talked Tuesday from his home in Boca Grande, an island off of the southwest coast of Florida. Despite claims to the contrary, he was lucid and feisty, just what you'd expect from an 82-year-old Italian grandfather from Brooklyn. And Frank Sr. got personal. My son is an alien, he said. There's no telling what he'll do. He's been like that for, oh, I don't know, how many years. We played baseball in the old days. He always chose the opposite side from me. He spoke freely in an unguarded manner, but not a previous stroke, nor his thick New York City accent could conceal his anger over the entire affair. Frank Franzetta Sr. is one of the world's best-known fantasy artists. His artwork has adorned record albums, movie posters, novels, and comic books. His style and sword and sorcery themes make his work instantly recognizable. Until recently, he's called the Pinocos his home. Living on a Marshall's Creek estate that includes a museum of the artist's work, and a home owned by his oldest son and his family. Alfonso Frank Franzetta, also known as Frank Jr., was arrested in December after police discovered he had allegedly broken into the family museum using a backhoe and removed about 90 works of his art painted by his father. Frank Jr., wearing a ski mask at the time of his arrest, said he had his father's permission to protect the art from other family members. Frank Jr. has three siblings, Bill Franzetta of Stroudsburg, owner of Franzetta's fantasy costumes in East Stroudsburg, and Heidi Graben and Holly Franzetta of Florida. At 52, Frank Jr. is the eldest and has been feuding with his three siblings since their mother died in 2009. Despite Frank Jr.'s claims that his father gave the go-ahead to secure the paintings. Prosecutors have said that the decisions regarding the artwork were the legal responsibility of Frank Jr.'s other three siblings exclusively. I really hate, hate reading out loud. I mean, it just sucks. And just to give you guys a little bit of the behind the scenes here, I'm using this, and the, uh, the articles that I'm reading from are really small so uh, just so you guys know what's going on behind the scenes here and then again editing sucks really bad too i hate editing i think more than anything in the world there are a few really interesting takeaways that i got from those articles and one is that first everybody loves to do artwork everybody loves to draw at some point when they're little kids and then they uh, either say i suck at this and they don't continue, and um, others, they continue as uh, Frank Franzetti did. And so he was uh, really very gifted at a very early age. And some people have just a natural born ability, and it doesn't have to be artwork. It could be anything from math or uh, sports, obviously, um, while other people have to develop and hone in on their skills. And art is something that you really need to develop. It's a, a lifelong process most of the times, and it requires a lot of patience and practice too, which a lot of people are not really willing to do. And uh, you know, everybody's art is different, and it's it's a lot like your uh, your thumbprint or your signature, it, it is vastly different from one person to another. And sometimes I can actually pick up the uh, piece of art if the person hasn't signed their name. Uh, I know who has done that sometimes, not all the times, but you actually get to uh, get to know who's done what piece of art. 
uh, if the more you uh, the more you see that is same with cards too right so in um, with enough shows you're, you're gonna see enough cards that you'll immediately pick up what is what um, but that, again that's why I like to go to card sh shows the other thing I got too with this is that uh, EC comics played a really interesting role within the sports card hobby very early on in fact so in like 1938 um, there was a, uh, a artist by the name of Bernard Krigstein who uh, did the 1938 Horrors of War set. He didn't do all the cards, but he did a lot of them. And he was in college at the time, but he was also uh, working for EC Comics too at one point. And so you have a lot of artists working for EC Comics. And when that uh, company shut down in like 19, I want to say 56, uh, they moved over to Tops, and they also worked for Bowman too. So you you have a lot of uh, the influence of these artists in our sports cards as well, especially um, Wally Wood, who did the initial uh, artwork for the 1962 Mars Attack set, and I, I did an article on that set, and I probably should update it at some point. But um, I think that. Uh, this is really kind of an interesting thing. I didn't know that Frank Mazzetta actually had sets out there. His artwork is really neat. I, I enjoy it, actually. And it actually influenced Conan the Barbarian, or as I like to say, Conan the Librarian from Saturday Night Live. But um, uh, the, the other thing that I found really interesting, too, and I kind of forgot about this, was that um, our, uh, our cards... Our artwork as well, their pieces of artwork, as you guys can see in the back here, either photography or um, re actually uh, lithographed artwork. And uh, we, we kind of tend to forget about these things too. But um, if you have uh, bad artwork or uh, a bad photograph, uh, it can greatly sway the value of a card or its collectability. I, um, I don't often show my artwork, uh, not that I don't like my own work, but a lot of artists don't like their own work. So um, I've never really shown it here on this channel. I am going to show you a little bit of what I've done in the past. And for the most part, my artwork was for the ball players and their families and for businesses as well. Let me know what you think about Frank Benzetta and his artwork or his books because he does have a bunch of books out there. Um, and I would love to hear what you guys have to say. So I will talk to you guys later. Have a good day.